This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, the subject is The Covenant. It's a book by historian and author Bernard Lamborell, and it discusses the Abrahamic faith, its origins and myths, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The Covenant is a book by Bernard Lamborell. It deals with the history and origins of the Abrahamic faiths uh, and how they intersect history and myth. Bernard, welcome. I like to give my guests a few minutes to give a little bit of background about themselves in their own words. So if you could, uh, could you tell me and viewers who you are, uh, what your interest is in uh, religion and the face and history and some particulars on the book? Sure. Well, thank you, Dan, for uh, having me. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm not much into labels, but I guess you could, uh, I would call myself a humanist or critical thinker. Um, I reject uh, man-made religions, but uh, I do acknowledge that spirituality is uh, an important component of the human experience. And um, I've, I've kind of uh, started the, or was kind of gotten to the rabbit hole, uh, if you will, uh, because uh, my mom is fairly religious. My dad is more of a skeptic. So I was kind of raised in between those two polarities. And uh, once in a while I was kind of look at the at the Bible and start reading and try to understand what what you know what what kind of um, uh, wisdom I could get out of it and uh, almost 15 16 <laughs> 17 years ago I guess now <laughs> uh, as I was reading the story of Abraham um, just a question pop up in my head, uh, which was, well, you know, because Abraham kind of eats with this God and, and discusses with him and, and has this very earthly discussion with him. And I kind of had this weird question. What if this God was not a God per se or deity, but more of a uh, more of a uh, uh, powerful king or overlord? And um, I started uh, investigating uh, the, the story, and I published a first book in 2006, which was received with, um, uh, I mean, interest from the readers, but uh, had questions regarding my uh, scholarship. Um, my background is in engineering, not in uh, history or in theology, and so people were questioning um, the, you know, the lack of background there. And so I signed up for a master in theology at the University of Montreal and completed all the courses, but did not really uh, finalize or got the paper for reasons we could go into later, but uh, essentially for because of my diverging views that didn't quite fit the uh, the mold there. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's where I, how I got here. Uh, so are you then Quebec-y? Yeah, I'm, I'm a Quebecer. I do live in Mexico right now, and uh, but was raised in uh, Montreal and studied in Montreal and spent most of my life and career in Montreal. I just, uh, I guess, after giving for 50 years of uh, endless winters, I decided to uh, <laughs> export myself south. So uh, is Canada generally more religious than the United States, uh, or is it more secular? Oh, it's far more secular, mm -hmm. um, especially uh, in Quebec in the uh, in late 60s. There was a uh, what's called a tranquil revolution where uh, most people rejected the, the, the church had a very strong presence in Quebec and that was kind of rejected. So uh, schools became secular and there was a big secular movement uh, in, in Quebec, mostly in Quebec. Um, so uh, before we get into the specifics of your book, I just want to... <clears throat> Uh, do some broad strokes talking about religion in general and your views. Uh, I remember reading uh, years ago, someone said that uh, Judaism was sort of the Abrahamic faith 1.0, Christianity 2.0, and Islam 3.0. Uh, would you agree with that? Do you think that uh, each of the religions has somehow built on the other? Uh, or, uh, you know, this this was propounded probably about 20 years ago uh, after the, sure. the, war, the clash of cultures uh, stuff became a meme. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's very clear, not only historically in terms of their evolution, but also in their content and how I think they're approaching the, the material. Uh, obviously, Islam is, is a little more different. Uh, Christianity has, has this, I mean, I kind of view it as a reinterpretation of the Old Testament. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not very much, uh, I, I'm ambivalent uh, when it comes to the historicity of Jesus, uh, whether or not a man called Jesus existed. 
that might have been a, uh, 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 a prophet or a priest. Uh, you know, that, that, I mean, that I'm open to that idea. So uh, I just I just haven't really spent a lot of time looking into that. But I definitely, in terms of the, uh, the these three religions, uh, build on the Abrahamic faith and the covenant that Abraham made with God. And I think by diving into that topic and by really trying to question whether or not that God was a, uh, a deity or a, uh, an overlord, uh, I think it affects all three. And um, yeah. So um, let, let's talk about uh, what the covenant is specifically. Uh, you said that you've been over a decade and a half uh, in the making. Uh, so what was the thing specifically about the story of uh, Abraham that that got to you um, and and so forth. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know when you read the story of Abraham, um, it, it it it's a very it's a very earthly um, story where uh, you can feel the presence of this Lord uh, in the story, and uh, there's actually very little. Uh, very little, um, I, I'd say, reference to uh, an immaterial presence or immaterial deity. Uh, you know, Abraham eats with this uh, character, speaks with him, engages with him, and uh, makes a covenant for, around the land. And so uh, when I first had this weird interrogation, uh, I started immediately kind of rewinded and started looking back at the story itself and see, does this story would make sense if Abraham was actually engaging with a, an overlord as opposed to a deity? And I was just shocked at how much coherent the story would look and, and, and how it took shape. And, uh, you know, it took me a long time to, initially it was just kind of curiosity and, and see, well, how far can I take this idea? And, um, and so initially, I, I didn't have any expectation. I thought it would just kind of fall flat and there would be no evidence, even if it was interesting intellectually, there would be no, no evidence to support that. But um, the more I kind of delved into it, the more I realized that, oh my God, you know, there are actually, it, it actually provides a new perspective and um, that enables us to revisit all the facts and uh, and really reinterpret them in a new uh, in a new perspective, which I believe uh, provides a pretty coherent uh, visual and, and answers brings a lot of answers to a lot of questions that uh, uh, scholars have kind of been uh, juggling with and, and puzzled with. Um, you know, it's interesting because uh, I was just talking the other day with someone I. I'm doing a five play cycle on the King Arthur myths. And uh, mm -hmm. there's, it, with King Arthur, there's the idea that Arthur wasn't his name, but it was the title of what a warlord was called, an arctor or a bear. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that's this very similar to what you're talking about when you talk about Yahweh and Elohim. Um, explain the difference between the two terms. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. And it's pretty fundamental in the sense that uh, you know, in the Bible, God appears with multiple names, and but the two most common names in the ancient testament, in the Old Testament, are Yahweh and Elohim in the Hebraic Bible, which are translated into uh, Lord and God. And uh, in in the history of scholarship of trying to understand the Bible, uh, the fact that those two names. Uh, are kind of intertwined and, and keep showing up, uh, has always intrigued scholars. And um, because, I believe, because most biblical scholars, at least the early biblical scholars, were believers, um, and the tradition, the Jewish traditions, always told us that those two names are one and the same God and indeed, if you you know the the vast majority of the uh, of the chapters in the Bible, you, you, you can't. You can dissociate those two terms. They, they, you know, sometimes one, one, you know, sometimes the word God will show up, another time it'll be Yahweh. But you, you can't really dissociate those two terms. But in specifically in the story of Abraham and in the story of the covenant, um, 
there's there's two not only two terms Yahweh and Elohim, but there's also two uh, two natures. There's a anthropomorphic uh, character and there's a immaterial character. And in most cases, uh, the name Lord is attached to the anthropomorphic figure, and uh, but not all the time. And Elohim is a little more anthropomorphic and immaterial. But if you, uh, you know, scholars have uh, assumed or, or made the, uh, the assumption that those two names represented one and the same character. And that character just happened to be sometimes anthropomorphic, sometimes immaterial. I, I took a different perspective. Uh, my perspective is what if there was an anthropomorphic character that should have been called Yahweh and the immaterial uh, God should have been Elohim, and those were two separate entities. And Yahweh was actually a, a lord or an overlord, and Elohim was, you know, kind of the pagan god of the the place. Um, how would the story build? And and that's the approach that I've taken. And uh, so basically, instead of assuming that we have uh, one character with two names, I've taken the approach that we have two characters with two names and one text, as opposed to multiple texts that were kind of combined together. Um, so it, because the, the Jewish religion, Judaism, is famous for borrowing things from other religions. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Jewish culture is very much an acquisitive culture in terms of bringing things in that fit better than something that came naturally to their culture. It's one of the reasons they blended into so many societies around the world. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems to me that, that what you're saying is this was something that might have been in, in the cultural DNA of Jews to, to take these pagan gods from whatever other cultures were around them uh, somewhere in the Levant and uh, uh, fuse them and, and, and make something new out of something old. Yeah, and you know, I think that's what humans in general do. If you look at more, most cultures, they've evolved through syncretism, you know, through contact with other cultures that had different belief and, and some of those beliefs were integrated into their own. Um, I, I think what's important to, to acknowledge here is the fact that uh, during, you know, in, in most of the Near East, during the Bronze Age, um, the cult of the Incesta was very present. So people would uh, worship their dead, they would celebrate their dead. And, and so the idea that a covenant was made uh, you know, with Abraham, uh, with a, uh, a Mesopotamian king, and that that covenant had had an objective, which was to uh, essentially preserve that trade corridor between Egypt and Mesopotamia, um, makes makes sense. And so, in the context of the cult of the uh, the cult of the dead or the cult of the ancestor, you could understand why. Um, such a such a covenant would lead to the deification of the memory of this Lord and, you know, would slowly fuse, as, you, as you're suggesting, with uh, the context of the, the covenant and the other types of, uh, uh, of cults that were there. And eventually, you know, out of that would evolve something that is very unique to Judaism because, uh, you know, we do find a, a lot of other myths. Uh, like the myth of the flood with uh, Noah in the story of Gilgamesh, the myth of creation in the uh, Enuma Elish, but there's no there's no equivalent to the covenant or no parallel with the story of a god making a covenant with a man during the Bronze Age, and so I think that's that's also indication that uh, possibly that story would have evolved from an actual treaty. So uh, secular treaty. Yeah. So uh, when you actually talk of the covenant between Abraham and Yahweh, or, or, or the God figure, uh, what are we talking about then? Are we talking about uh, let, let Let's talk about what you you think might have been the actual historical covenant between Abraham, or, or if there was an Abraham and some other mm -hmm. fit leader figure uh, of another culture, and what became the myth, the mythic covenant between Abraham of the Bible and God. Um, yeah, well, essentially, uh, you know, if you, I, I, I think part of the, uh, uh, well, let me, let me just better understand your, your question here. Are, are you, are you thinking in terms of the evolution of how we went from a secular covenant to a religious one or Yeah, how so I mean, if, if we had two, if we had two 
humans making a pact mm -hmm. of some sort yeah. between two cultures. How did that evolve into Abraham uh, and uh, I, the Isaac stuff and, uh, you know, sure. with, with the God figure? How did that morph from just a treaty to something yeah. mythic? Okay, so I, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of parameters that, that get involved in here. Uh, one of them is the fact that nomadic pe people, uh, you know, in terms of their, in terms of their belief, uh, had a very strong uh, relationship with the cult of the dead and their ancestors because they were continuously on the move. And so uh, having the ability to bring their gods with them was important. Uh, meanwhile, uh, sedentary people that were uh, dwelling in cities uh, would typically have their own local god that they would worship to. And so in the process of uh, giving the land to a nomadic people, I mean, Abraham and his group uh, you know, were nomadic at the time, and they didn't have a, a land per se. So with this uh, treaty or this covenant, Abraham ended up inheriting this land and protecting this land. And so, uh, you know, could, could have evolved the, the worship, you know, from the cult of their dead to the cult of a local deity. And, and actually, Abraham uh, dwelled quite a bit in, the, in, the, in Shechem, uh, which is today's Nablus. And uh, we find in, in this city uh, the remains of a, a temple, uh, which is the temple of Be Baal Berith. And Baal Berith in uh, Hebrew means uh, Lord of Covenant. And so the, the Bible and, and history presented this temple as a pagan temple and all that. But I believe that this was the original temple uh, dedicated to the worshiping initially of this, uh, this uh, king. And eventually that, you know, after a few generations, obviously people forgot about the fact that there was a natural man and they just were just kept worshiping his memory. And he became the Baal and uh, basically slowly uh, you know, uh, through syncretism and uh, other influence from Egypt and all that that we could get into eventually became known as Yahweh. So uh, you mentioned this uh, uh, Baal Berith, and I've seen the name, I didn't know how to pronounce it, B-A-A-L, and I always uh, thought that was uh, connected with the, the term Belial, uh, which is, you know, a satanic thing. Is, is there any connection between that? Is that something that became an offshoot, the idea of a satanic being or a, a master of evil, um, or is that totally separate? Well, that's that's an interesting question, uh, you know, and, and and obviously I am I'm offering an explanation uh, in in the book that I'm exploring in terms of the origin of the uh, the name Yah itself, you know, because yeah. Yahweh is referred to as Yahweh, and it's he's also referred to as Yah. There are some psalms that are celebrating Yah, and um, so where is Yah coming from? We know it's a theophoric name. A lot of names in, in uh, uh, Jewish names do end or begin with Yah. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting when you look at the Akkadian, which was kind of the uh, diplomatic language uh, at the time during the uh, Middle Bronze Age, uh, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, Baal Yah actually meant my Lord. Uh, in, 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 in Hebrew, we would say Baali, would be my lord, but in Akkadian it'd be Baal, uh, Baal Yah, and uh, Baal Yah El would be my lord God, mm. and so Baal Yah is uh, is appears to be a contracted form of uh, Baal Yah, my God, if you will, or or my lord God, and um, so I, I I'm I'm suggesting that perhaps there is a uh, an influence from Akkadian where that term Yah uh, would have, could have been potentially uh, misunderstood from, not from a, uh, a possessive adjective, but more just as a, uh, you know, if the term, because in, in, in Hebrew, uh, Baal Yah means, you know, the Lord Yah, uh, but in Akkadian, it means my Lord. And so perhaps, perhaps that's where we find a, a, a disconnect between the Akkadian and, and the Hebrew that would have given birth to this term Yah. And, um, and, and obviously throughout the history of Israel, we see this continuous fight against the Baal that the Canaan are worshiping. And uh, 
I, I believe that throughout the evolution of the faith, uh, there was a time where a group of people uh, decided to start worshiping Yah instead of Baal. And uh, I'm offering the, uh, the, the idea that potentially uh, the name, name Yahweh uh, actually represents a, uh, a compounded deity. Because that was something that was quite common as well in the Near East, where people would take two deities, combine them together, and that would form a new deity. It would not replace the old ones. It would just create a new deity that embodied the characteristics and the power, the power of, that, of that new deity. And so I, I'm suggesting that perhaps Baal and Asherah, were the, which were the most common uh, deities, the most important deities in Ugarit at the time, would have essentially combined into becoming uh, Baal Yah, Wa Baala, which means Lord Yah and her and his consort. Um, and uh, if you extract the terms Baal from those from this expression, you end up with the tetragrammaton, which is Yahweh, the letters Yahweh. And um, and it's interesting, I believe that. Uh, we have this uh, sitting in front of us uh, uh, where we don't really have a good explanation for the origin of Yahweh. But by, by and, and there are multiple uh, uh, evidence suggesting that Yahweh evolved out of Baal. And so both in terms of the worship, in terms of the context, in terms of archaeology, uh, th there's a blurring line. When you try to trace back the history of Yahweh, it just seems to be disappearing at some point and, and intertwines with Baal. And so um, it, it seems to offer a good explanation as to how it would have gone from worshiping Baal and Asherah into worshiping this one deity now called Yahweh that would be unique to Israel. And, um, and, and, and then, you know, a fight between people wanting to worship Yahweh, because Yahweh would obviously be a, a stronger, more powerful God than Baal and Asherah separate, um, you know, that would have kind of began that repudiation process of uh, fighting against the Baal. Um, so uh, you had mentioned uh, Akkad, which would Sargon of Akkad. Uh, Talk about this momentarily, because you do go into it in the book a bit about the Akkadian Empire. Uh, how close was it to, to uh, the ancient Israelis? Uh, and uh, was there any other, other than maybe mythic overflow, were they trading partners? Were, were they enemies of the state of Israel uh, or, or the Jewish people? Uh, what was the interaction and any cross-cultural exchange specific to those two entities? Okay, so I mean, Sargon of Akkad was, uh, you know, lived probably around the 22nd or 21st century uh, before the Common Era, uh, which probably brings us four or five hundred years before what I think uh, would have been Abraham's time. Uh, but definitely, he was the first one to uh, build an empire uh, in today's uh, Iraq, uh, basically with Euphrates uh, from the, Sum the Sumerian all the way to the Mesopotamian Empire, all the way to uh, almost close to Turkey. And, um, and so that, that was the, the first time uh, such a large empire was established. Um, after Sargon, there has been a number of leaders who've tried to maintain, but that empire kind of uh, shrunk. <laughs> and uh, King Hammurabi uh, is, is basically the, the next figure who was able to reinstate that major empire. Okay, so King Hammurabi is the next uh, king or powerful man who was able to reunify most of Mesopotamia. And I mean, at the time, that was a huge, uh, a huge region, giving the, the, the communication means and all that, and, and maintaining that power over uh, such an empire was quite a feat. Uh, actually, shortly after uh, Hammurabi, that again, that empire. Uh, shrunk again, but and, and that's probably one of the weakest uh, argument uh, in terms of uh, of the book, uh, in terms of being able to draw a connection between uh, Mesopotamia and the Levant, because uh, we don't have any record uh, uh, of such a dominance. 
Uh, we know that the empire uh, extended to the border of uh, the Levant uh, or close to, but not quite there. And there are some, some challenges in terms of being able to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, King Hammurabi uh, would have been able to exercise his power over the Levant, uh, but it's not impossible. And uh, so we're kind of facing a lack of evidence here more than anything. Um, and, and so, um, uh, I mean, later in the history of, of Israel, then obviously we have the, uh, the Persians and the Akkadians that are uh, reestablishing uh, dominance over that region. Uh, I, I think they're reestablishing it, but uh, in, in the history, at, at least for, for historical record, they, they are um, becoming vassals. I mean, they, they've been vassals of Egypt uh, at a later point in time. And, and so it, it was definitely uh, uh, um, a land or a geography that was disputed between Egypt and, and Mesopotamia. Um, well, I think it's fair to say uh, that your book is equally a literary exploration as it is a literal explore, exploration of uh, uh, the, the myth. So, I mean, I, I didn't take it as, as being as grounded in, in pure historical fact that you can, uh, there seemed to be a melding of the literary and the literal. Would that be mm -hmm. uh, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's been 3,500 years that have you know the span between what we have today and 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 the text we have to rely on. Uh, I'm actually quite, and and I'm arguing uh, to in favor of uh, showing that the text is actually much older than what most modern scholars would uh, acknowledge today. Most people, most scholars would believe or would claim that this text was probably written down sometimes around the 7th, 6th, or 5th century before the Common Era. Um, and uh, and uh, there's a number of, obviously, arguments they're using to justify that. And I pers personally believe that uh, we can argue just as favorably uh, for a text that was written as opposed to having a oral uh, oral origin again, like most people think, yeah, it might the text might have been older, but was passed down orally and was only written down uh, in in those centuries. Uh, but I believe a case can be made that the text was written much earlier. And part of the argument is that because it was a state affair, because a covenant, um, you know, represented such a uh, an important uh, treaty that um, it, it, it could have definitely been written down much earlier. And uh, I believe that would have been in the uh, 18th century uh, before the Common Era. Um, just to explore a little bit more about the literary uh, aspect of the book, you do, mm -hmm. do digress uh, uh, to talk about some of the names that are made from uh, Elohim and uh Yahweh, uh, for example, you know, a, a name like Samuel or my name, mm -hmm. Daniel. Um, mm -hmm. Daniel means either swift or the swift just, judgment of God. Or swift, judgment of God, yes. Yeah. But then yes. there's a name like Elijah, which has both El and Yah in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know what that means. Does it mean it, Elijah, is Elijah somehow saying God to yes, Lord? I, uh, I believe it means uh, uh, Lord is my God. Okay, so, so is that supposed to be... Is, is that sort of an acknowledgement, uh, though, in, a, in some odd way, that uh, of that history? Does that name in and of itself con contain sort of the transition of? Uh, the I, I, yeah, I, I, I think so. And uh, again, you know, I, 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 I'm not. I'm certainly not suggesting that people were aware of what was happening. I think yeah. there was such a long period of time, you know, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years uh, over which this, you know, this covenant took place and became a myth, <laughs> uh, you know, quite, quite early on. And, and so I believe that, yeah, the line did blur between, uh, you know, the deity and, and the actual Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some evidence in the text that we can find that helps support the idea that this Lord was indeed a, um, a, a, a man or an overlord. And, and as you're pointing, there's evidence in the text as well to show that 
this Lord was perceived as a God and, uh, you know, a name like Eliah, uh, which I, I think probably at the time that name was, uh, let's say, created or used, uh, the myth was probably already well entrenched. And so I don't think it was a uh, justi justification that to reinforce the idea, but certainly the, the, the fact that they were facing, uh, I mean, you know, throughout the history of, of the Bible, we're facing the same thing. You know, we have this character, Yahweh, which is the God of Israel. And, and so, uh, you know, is the, 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 which came first, <laughs> the chicken or the egg? <laughs> uh, I want to talk about a, a few of the things that stuck out to me uh, in the book. You do go uh, digress on uh, the, the compound gods of, of the area, mm -hmm. and you most notably talk about the Egyptians. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, can you go and, and just talk a little bit about, uh, number one, uh, the tradition of the Egyptians in making compound gods and how that may have mm -hmm. rubbed off on uh, the Israelis, especially since, as far as I know, and I'm not a scholar, I, it seems to me that as far as I know that the idea of Jews being enslaved in Egypt has pretty much been debunked his, historically. I'm not, you know, and so... Uh, how does that all play in? Do, 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 does the idea of Jews being enslaved in Egypt somehow lend credence to their then making compound gods as the, the Egyptian masses might have? Or if that isn't historically true, is it just a coincidence? Yeah, that's a very good, que good question. Um, well, I, I, I guess, first of all, every, you know, you have to keep the historical timeline in mind as you are you are trying to uh, project how information should be interpreted, right? So uh, there has been compounded deities in Egypt for a long time. So we can we can go back two thousand years, you know, before common era, and we do have uh, elements of compounded deity. But we also know that uh, uh, Tutankhamun or, or um, um, uh, Akhenaten, the uh, the uh, uh, the um, that is often seen as the uh, um, her uh, heretic, uh, heretic pharaoh because he tried to impose a single god. Um, there was, and, and, and we're, we're in the uh, 15th century, so 1400 something, uh, before, or 1300 uh, something before the common era, and that's just before, and there was, I mean, we have the Amarna letters. So the Amarna letters is, is, is are letters of communication when Canaan was a vassal state of Egypt. And, and we should keep that in mind that for about 300 years, almost 300 years, uh, the, um, the Jews and, and Canaan was a vassal state of Egypt. So as a vassal state of Egypt, obviously there's not only military influence and, and, and uh, governing influence, but there's also religious influence. And so if, um, if in Egypt, um, you know, Akhenaten is worshiping a single god, um, and uh, Ray in this case, uh, which is the sun, um, there are, also examples of other compounded deities in Kenyan, in Ugarit, you know, that probably around the same time or, or later. Um, so the, the issue of the Jews being slaves in Egypt, uh, I'm, I'm not sure why there aren't more scholars raising the question to the fact that if Kenyan or Israel uh, was was a vassal state of Egypt, why they would not, could not perceive themselves as slaves in Egypt. They were under Egyptian dominance at the time. And uh, what I tried to demonstrate in, in the book is that um, the moment the exodus happened is the moment where the Hittites and Egypt, Ramses II, were basically in war against each other. So Egypt was trying to um, maintain its territory all the way up to Kadesh in the north of uh, Israel and the Hittites were pushing down and, and they were conflicting on that border. And um, the Battle of Kadesh, which took place in uh, 
12, around, well, ended in 1274, 1275, uh, is the beginning of when um, Israel recovered its kind of its freedom uh, from Egyptian dominance. And so, and, and again, criminologically, I'm trying to show that uh, this perfectly matches with the dates we have uh, once we do some criminological corrections. But I, I, I do believe, again, that you know, if you look throughout history, we don't have to set the Jews in today's modern Egypt and try to find them to exit the country. I think we can leave the, 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 the Israelites in the extended Egypt of the time, which again covered the entire area of Israel and Canaan, and, and just see the withdrawing of Egypt as a liberation of the Jews and the Exodus. Um, let's talk about Hammurabi. You mentioned him a bit earlier, and uh, obviously he's most uh, well known for the Hammurabi, the Code of Hammurabi, uh, which uh, has, by some people's standards, was one of the first set of encoded mm -hmm. laws, and even English common law is sometimes said to ha have some basis in it. Um, uh, but it, when you speak of Hammurabi, you're not talking so much about his his code. Uh, as much as it is his influence on uh, on this uh, this transformative myth, um, talk to me about what you discovered about Hammurabi and his influence on uh, the the myth of of the warlord become god. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's another interesting uh, thing because we don't have. I mean, we do have evidence that during his lifetime or his reign. Um, he was referred to as a god, although he never himself, uh, at least in the documents we have, claimed to be a god. But he had such a um, such an aura of uh, influence that uh, you know, for I mean, he among all the kings of antiquity and, and the Bronze Age, he is the one king that has that had the longest legacy and the, the biggest influence. Uh, not only in the code of law, as you say, but also in terms of just the geography <laughs> of the place. And uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, so I, you know, what I'm trying, I, again, because we don't have any direct evidence to support the idea that Hammurabi would have made uh, a covenant with Abraham. And what I'm trying to do in the book is demonstrate that uh, through through, I, I would say, the, the chronologies and their history, their reciprocal history, we, we can actually kind of create a very intertwined chronology of how things could have happened, um, which is, is challenging in terms of claiming this is just, um, just an accident. Uh, there are certain things that are very difficult to explain if it was just an accident in terms of how the dates match between what we know of Hammurabi's dynasty and what we know of the Bible in terms of the history. Because you can, you know, you, throughout the history of, of the Bible, you can take all the chronologies. We know what, what how old Abraham was when he got in Canaan, how old he was when he had a son, etc. So you can kind of add up all these chronologies. And if you do the same thing on Hammurabi's side, and you try to see, was there a possibility, even a possibility for those two men to uh, to create this covenant and under what circumstances and what was um, you know what was Hammurabi uh, um, um, you know in terms of his uh, his territory or his his, uh, his empire what he was going through at the time and and how how that could match is is quite interesting. Well, um, that brings up uh, another aspect that I wanted to speak of and. Uh, Again, I'm not a biblical scholar, uh, nor a scholar of uh, the Middle East, uh, but I never heard of what you call the 610 multiplier. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's considered a theory or is it just a way to approach things? Because what you do uh, in a number of instances, you try to sort of line up different figures in that area and, and try to see if they can line up by using uh, several of these uh, formula the most noted one being the 610 multiplier, to say that, well, we know, for example, that Methuselah didn't live 969 years, but 
uh, uh, can you explain what the 610 multiplier is sure. and how you then uh, uh, use that to sort of line up the various kings and, and deities and, and Abraham in the book? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I haven't seen anyone uh, suggest or come up with that uh, 16, 610 formula elsewhere. That, so that, you, that is you. That yeah. Is you. Okay. yeah. I mean, it, it basically came up because the more, you know, as I, as I was digging into this information and as I started to see all these evidence wanting to, uh, wanting to converge, uh, you know, obviously you can't, I mean, I, I was continuously trying to say, okay, maybe, maybe I'm just, maybe this is wrong and maybe there's evidence that will prove me wrong and I'll keep looking for something that'll confirm that this is indeed wrong. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking, well, if it is correct, then this has to work. And, and we have to be able to find somebody or potentially there has to, even if we're not able to find them, there must have been somebody in history with whom Abraham would made, made that covenant. And, and so I started with the idea that, uh, first of all, when you look in the Bible, the notion of time and, and just same thing, same way in history. You know, it's easy for us because we have a calendar, the Roman calendar, who started on year zero, uh, and, and we've kind of been sticking to it since then. But in the Bronze Age and, and during those times, the notion of calendar didn't really exist. So it was only strictly about, you know, the nth year of so-and-so's reign, uh, this thing happened. And and so the, the one thing we know, though, is that if... And that was the, 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 my, the question I started with. If Abraham did exist, if he made a covenant with a Mesopotamian overlord, uh, then we need to look into Mesopotamia at this time to see what, what was used from a uh, calendar standpoint. And the Mesopotamian were using uh, the base 60. And, and this is the, the legacy we have today on our, you know, with the, the clocks or the angular system where everything is based around 60. Uh, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, 360 degrees. That comes from uh, the uh, the Mesopotamian and during the time of Hammurabi, and and we basically kept that because it was it's a convenient system. Um, and so, if again, if Abraham made a covenant with a Mesopotamian overlord at a time when people were using the sexagesimal instead of decimal base, um, is it possible that? a mistake was made when converting from sexagesimal to decimal. Because the, the numbers that we have in the Bible cannot be around base 60, because base 60 starts from 0 to 59, and then it becomes 100. Zero, zero. Uh, you know, so it's like on your watch, you have 69 minutes, then it's an hour. So the, the dates in, in the story of the Old Testament um, just aren't sexagesimal. So that's why I thought maybe they were poorly converted. And we know that in history, uh, the Greeks uh, mentioned that they, they, they had issues converting from sexual decimal. And it's, it's not obvious. I mean, if you're, if you're a, a priest and, and, and you're not familiar with the sexual decimal base, how do you convert? Um, so the easiest way and, and what I'm trying to show people in the book is that there's a very easy way to make a mistake, which is, you know, if, if I was telling you, Dan, your watch has 60 minutes. But I decided to create a watch with 100 minutes. And so every time I've got an hour, I've got 100 minutes. And if I told you, Dan, we're going to meet in a quarter of an hour from now, on your watch, that would be 15 minutes. On my watch, that would be 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that the priest who converted from sexual decimal to decimal used that method to convert. And, but this is wrong because you can only apply this method if you're converting fraction. I'm converting fraction of an hour. So a quarter of an hour, which is 15 minutes, gets converted into 25. But if we're talking about years, uh, 15 years in sexual decimal is still 15 years in decimal. And so you should not make that conversion. And, and so the, the way to undo the conversion is the 610 multiplier. So if you multiply 25 by 610, you end up with 15 years. And so what I did throughout the book is systematically apply that conversion factor on every date and every, every time span of the Old Testament. And, you know, we end up, again, with a chronology that just want to fit. 
And, and, and that's how I'm relining and showing how the exodus might have happened right in the, right in the, uh, in the uh, reign of uh, Ramses II, which interestingly, every scholar says, well, if, if anything happened, it should have happened under Ramses II, but the dates don't match. And indeed, the, the interesting thing in the Bible, there are multiple ways to calculate the date of the exodus. And, and they're both going, you know, if you start from Salmon's temple, you go way before what should be Ramses II. And if you start from the expulsion of the, uh, the uh, Israelites from Egypt and the descendants and where, they, where Jewish tradition claims Abraham should have lived, then, then you again end up in the wrong place. But if you multiply these two spans by 0.6, they both go exactly to the same place, which is this uh, the, the Battle of Kadesh again and, and the beginning of the um, of the, um, the liberation of the, uh, the Israelites. Now that that works for for the historical events. But when we're talking uh, about uh, some of the biblical characters that lived eight, nine hundred plus years, yeah. um, how do we how do we get an idea uh, that they may have only lived 75 years rather than 950? Right. So so I think. And, and again, I mean, all this is speculative, right? But I, I'm not the only one suggesting that. I believe that uh, you have, for instance, a Sumerian king list that we're aware of in, in history, which have people living thousands of years. Um, but again, what is the notion of time? You know, for me, the notion of time is just a cycle you keep track of. And so if it's, the, the simplest cycle is the cycle of the day. And if you take some Sumerian kings that live 28,000 days, instead of years, then you, you know, that's close to 75 year old. So that kind of makes sense. And then if you look at Noah, which was living, you know, in the 900 years or so, uh, you know, maybe the next easy cycle to use would be the lunar cycle. So if you divide that by 12.7, which is the number of lunar cycle in a year, then again, you end up around, you know, 70, 75 year old. Uh, and, and so I think people have used different methods that for keeping track of time. And obviously it's not convenient to use days because it, especially if you're a nomad, uh, you know, it's not easy, but if you're uh, uh, keeping track with, with lunar cycle is a little easier. And, uh, you know, when calendars and, and all that were invented, the annual calendars and, 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 you know, it became easier, especially for uh, people in, in established cities with, uh, with uh, astronomers and all that to be able to keep track of years, so um, but in sexagesimal numbers. <laughs> uh, so I want to uh, sort of uh, begin wrapping up. And my first question: I've got two or three final questions here. The first okay. one would be that uh, um, what? Uh, well, let me see. Uh, let me, uh, what is is the general thesis though that you leave your book with that of? Uh, you or future researchers should pick up on to further uh, either prove or disprove your claims? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think uh, I, I think that, uh, and, and this is interesting because a lot of people read the book, find the 610 multiplier, the most important uh, evidence. And I, I think it's interesting, but I, I do believe that just the idea of what if, what if Abraham had made a covenant with a mortal overlord? What if, what if the, uh, the story of Abraham, instead of being a myth, was rooted in uh, historical reality around this covenant? Um, I think scholars, by just asking those questions and just revisiting all the evidence, uh, are going to come to a very different conclusion. Um, and, and so that, that I think is the bigger, uh, takeaway. I think it, it, it does not, I mean, obviously it, it's, it does not render everything they've done invalid. I think it's just a premise that has to change because we can absolutely justify their current position. I mean, that's what, that's what scholars have been doing for the last 40 years is to demonstrate why they believe the story is only evolved during the uh, sixth or you know seventh, sixth or fifth century before common era, and why it's a myth and why it cannot exist, and and so on. But the minute, and that's I think that's the most fascinating part. The minute that you open yourself to the idea that 
perhaps that perhaps that covenant did take place. Perhaps it was with a mortal, and perhaps that mortal was elevated, or the memory of that mortal was elevated. In my opinion, everything starts falling into place, and we get a much clearer picture and a much better appreciation for myself. I, I've got a I've got a, a immense respect for. Uh, the writers of the Bible and how they collected this information and how they evolved uh, their theology around this. Um, but yeah, I do believe that uh, scholars need to uh, ask that question. Um, let me ask a question uh, outside of the book. Uh, let's say that mm -hmm. we take that everything that you've claimed is so. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask, why do you think that let's call it the Abrahamic mythos that has produced Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, why has that survived as a religious, uh, religious ideas, which a lot of people say are just myths that we still believe in, versus, say, the Greek and the Norse myths, which have been discarded and are clearly now labeled myths? Uh, is it because uh, Yahweh is so much more compelling a figure than Odin or, or uh, hmm. Zeus? Or is it because you think that it might be that uh, the people who propounded this, the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims, had some maybe knowledge, even if it's, we're talking like cultural, racial memory, of it being grounded in a reality, whereas, whereas Zeus and Odin and, and Asgard and Olympus were clearly, even the people then knew it was just good storytelling. Yeah, I, I, I love it because as you were asking the question, uh, you, you kind of provided the answer, oh, okay. I think. I, 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 I think the, I, I, I totally agree, you know, I think the fact that it was rooted, because I've always been challenged with, you know, modern scholars saying, oh, this, this myth was, you know, created to provide a, a sense of unity to the Israelites at the moment they were in captivity in Babylon. But how do you impose that to an entire people? I mean, you, just, you don't make that stuff up, you know? I mean, you, it, it has to be in your genetic. And so uh, I think if you, and, and what a, I mean, one of, I mean, one of the things we haven't touched on, but obviously it's, it's, it opens kind of a, a can of worms, is, is the idea that this Lord would have actually been the one who fathered Isaac. And so, the descendants of Abraham were not only, you know, spiritual descendants, they were the genetic descendants of this Lord. And so I, I think it grounded everything into an even stronger reality. And, uh, and, and so as the myth evolved around that, there was all the elders and everybody could really confirm how real, how strong and how critical and important because the whole aspect of, the land, the land of Israel, and the gift of the land, and how the Jews became, or the Israelites at first became, the uh, to inherit the land from God. I mean, what more powerful than a God that, that, than the land that was given to you by God? You know, I mean, it's it, we we still we still we still have issues with that today, and and a lot of the world's challenges revolve around uh, that idea. So I think the fact, you know, claiming it was not rooted in, in reality is the difficult position to hold. And so do you think that's, uh, uh, well, I had mentioned earlier the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 3.0 uh, uh, version mm -hmm. of, of things that some pe other people have mentioned. Do you, do you think that uh, is in a sense is Islam a more refined Christianity, which is a more refined Judaism, or has have they gotten farther away with each version from that historical grounding? I, I, I think every religion has adapted the story and, and the claims to their historical reality. Well, for so example, the, the name Allah is is Allah related still back to Elohim? To El. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Eloah is a singular of uh, Elohim, and you know, I mean, I mean, Ar the uh, Arab, uh, you know, evolved from Hebrew in both in terms of uh, you know the scripts and and the language. There's you know, it's a Semitic language, and uh, you know, so I think, I mean, what, what's interesting actually, if we talk about Muslim, uh, they they agree on the same story 
as the uh, the Jews and the Christian in terms of the story of Abraham. It's it's the same context, it's the same idea, it's the same people, uh, but they disagree on one thing, which is the name of the son that is asked to be sacrificed. And and I believe that's that's evidence that supports my work. Um, and and I believe that part of the reason uh, they dropped that name and and they dropped the name Elohim. And, 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 and Yahweh in favor of Allah is, again, to simplify the message. Yeah. I think I think whoever wrote the Quran, uh, whether it was Muhammad or somebody else uh, in his entourage, um, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that they dropped a number of things from the number of challenges or things that aren't clear in the Bible were dropped. So those two names were replaced by a single name, Allah, simplification. Uh, in terms of the sto- story of Sodom, uh, the, the entire Genesis 14, which is a problematic chapter, which I try to show is actually very critical in understanding everything, has been dropped as well. So we don't talk about uh, you know those foreign kings coming and, and so on. So I think, I think the, the, the message in the Quran in, at least in terms of Abraham, has been simplified, mm-hmm. and in terms of the, the the Bible in general, has been simplified. You bring up uh, I, I, this just came to me. Uh, Jesus is absent in this book, pretty much. Um, was the whole Jesus or Yeshua or whatever you want to call him, uh, and as well as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the idea of the Trinity? Because if we have two coming together to form one. And then all of a mm-hmm. sudden, at some point, it gets split into three here. Um, mm-hmm. These are then, would then, I guess, be just later mythic add-ons rather than based in the his- historicity. I mean, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of Jesus, I, I don't have much. I, I've never studied in detail. So I just have my own personal, you know, I've looked into it a bit, but I've not, I, I, I don't have nearly as much. Uh, qualification or, or experience to, to talk about that. Okay. My personal feeling uh, is that um, the, the, the entire Gospels are basically uh, a, not a condemnation, but a reinterpretation of the Old Testament, uh, trying to modernize, uh, trying to modernize the Old Testament at the time when you know, Buddhism um, and uh, uh, Zoroastrianism and, and other religions were in vogue. And I think there's influence from, from those. Well, finally, let me ask you then, uh, where do you go from here in terms of research? Are you going to follow up on this or are you going to just go off on a totally different tangent, you know, maybe explore, you know, Aztec culture or something since you're in Mexico? <laughs> no, I think... I think uh, you know it's it, it's kind of been a lonely journey for me in a sense that uh, it's it's not easy to get the time of day to explore this venue with scholars, and so the immediate reaction is that you know if I just come out and just say oh I believe Abraham existed and made a covenant with the Lord, uh, that fails the, the smell test, <laughs> you know, and so. Because uh, at the end of the day, I'm 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 having them to uh, almost re-question or question at least uh, 40 years of scholarship, mm. and so so far it's been it's been a challenge, and it's it's it continues to be a challenge, um, but uh, it doesn't mean it it's not going to happen. So I, I'm still hoping for that. Well, EarthlyCovenant.com is your website. I'll link to that. I'll also link to the Amazon page for the book. Uh, I want to thank you for spending about an hour or so speaking about uh, your ideas about uh, the evolution and history of, uh, if we want to call it the God myth or the myth come or the the man come God or the man come myth. Um, it's a it's an interesting book. I do think it 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 it, it probably is something that for your 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 person just. Uh, and it, it takes a little bit more digging into it. It's not, it's not a book that, that if, it's not an easy read in some ways. It, mm-hmm. It's something that you have to really uh, uh, be interested Sink your in. Teeth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, uh, again, I want to thank you for your time. It was a good conversation. So thank you again. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks for the opportunity.